Hey folks, welcome back to the EDM studio. Today I'm going to be talking about the ESE synth. What's kind of neat is the ESE and the ES1 and the ES2 all use principles that I've talked about in the past. So I've talked about waveforms like square waves, triangle waves, saw waves, sine waves. We talked about filters like low pass and high pass filters. And we talked about effects like reverb and delay. And the ESE uses all those techniques, but the ES1 and the ES2 are also doing the same thing. They're just kind of more complex ways of wiring the same ideas together. One thing that's kind of neat about the ESE, though, is that it uses a technique called pulse width modulation. And I haven't really talked explicitly about that, although I've kind of hinted at it at, uh, in other videos when I talked about signals and square waves. But I want to talk about pulse width modulation first, and then we can dive into logic and kind of go through how you can uh, use the ESC to create various different sounds. So the concept behind pulse width modulation is really based on the square wave that we talked about in the signals video. If you recall, with the square wave, it's just a signal that basically oscillates between two DC values. And this is an ideal square wave. It's actually not possible to create an exact square wave uh, in a physical system. But what was interesting about this is that then when we went into the frequency domain, and now this picture should make a lot more sense since we talked about Fourier transforms, you have energy content at the odd harmonic. So energy at the first harmonic, third harmonic, fifth harmonic, and then this decaying exponential of amplitude. Pulse width modulation is just a generalized version of this same signal. So rather than equally oscillating between these two DC values, it now oscillates uh, for some period of time before switching to the other value. And this signal is still periodic, but the ratio may not be 50-50. So what we're going to do is we're going to say the period of time when the signal is at the high DC value, we're going to call that length t. And then the amount of time that the signal um, takes to repeat, the period of the signal, we're going to call k. And t over k is what we call the pulse width. So for instance, if you're talking about a square wave, it's at the up DC value for, uh, say, half a second, and then at the low DC value for half a second, then your t value would be Point, sorry, your T value would be, say, 500 milliseconds, and your K value would be 1,000 milliseconds. So your T over K would then be 0.5. But if you're uh, at the up value for, say, 250 milliseconds, and then at the down value for 750 milliseconds, your T over K value would be 250 over 1,000, which would be 25%. So that would be a what we call a 25% pulse width modulated signal. And I know I got a little heavy in the math on the last video, um, but we can actually derive the, uh, the weightings for each of the harmonics in the harmonic series for a pulse width modulated signal. It turns out that this is the weighting equation. So we have this uh, component at the front, which is uh, 2 over n pi, where n is the harmonic, and then that's multiplied by sine of n pi d, where n again is the harmonic, and d is the uh, pulse width, t over k. So I'm not going to go too far into this, but one thing that's kind of neat is this explains why you have content only at the odd harmonics in the square wave. Because in the square wave, uh, this component here, sine n pi d, uh, is equal to, so let's just ignore this part, right, because this is going to be some positive number, no matter what n is. You get, uh, at any n, you get sine of n pi over 2, right, because uh, d is 0.5. So now, what happens if we plug in these values of n. Well, okay, sine of, um, if, if n is 0, then you get sine of 0, which is 0. If sine is 1, you're going to get some uh, sine of pi over 2, which is uh, 
non-zero, uh, it's equal to 1, sine of uh, n equal to 2 would give you sine of pi, which is 0. Sine of 3 would give you sine of 3 pi over 2, which is negative 1. And then sine of 4 uh, would give you sine of 4 pi over 2, or sine of 2 pi, which is 0, and so on. So um, you can actually get these values by plugging in to this equation. And uh, hopefully that gives you some a little bit more depth in the explanation for why it was that our frequency domain looked like this. But we can actually calculate exactly what that plot should look like for any given pulse width um, in any given harmonic series. So let's take a look at logic, and I can talk about the ESE and uh, some of the various features there. All right, so here we are in logic, and I've got a ESE set up uh, going through the graphical EQ so you can see what's going on. And I thought I'd just start by kind of going through all the various functions of the ESE. So again, there should be nothing new here. Like we've talked about all these different things. We've talked about waveforms, filters, uh, low frequency oscillators, envelopes, and various effects. So let's just divide it into all those sections. Over here, you've got your waveform generator portion. Down here, you've got a um, low frequency oscillator. And you can actually use this to either affect uh, pitch or the pulse width. Here, you've got a envelope section. And then over here, we've got various effects. So. Nothing new here, and ES1 and ES2 also use these approaches, but it's just kind of, you got to learn the different layouts for the different synths, but they're all basically doing the same thing. Uh, so let's go through these one by one. So over here, uh, in terms of the waveforms that you can generate, uh, there's really only two things you can select. On the left, we've got um, the organ pipe selector. So there's another synth that I talked about that was built this way, but essentially, uh, this goes back to the length of the pipes in the organ, and they effectively mean uh, the octave you're talking about. So 4 would be the highest pitch, 8 would be an octave below that, and 16 would be an octave below that. And then over here, um, there's kind of like two main waveforms you can generate. So all the way to the left, you get a sawtooth wave, and then as soon as you go up a bit, you get a square wave, and then the various pulse width modulated versions of it um, becoming narrower and narrower as you turn to the right. So again, you got the saw wave, and then you got the square wave becoming a narrower and narrower pulse width modulated wave that we just talked about. So that's the waveform section. Uh, down here, you've got a low frequency oscillator, and it can modify two things. So if you're using the sawtooth wave, then this selector becomes a vibrato uh, switch and it uh, sets the depth of the modulation. If you are using a pulse width modulated signal, then the low frequency oscillator um, modulates the pulse width and this uh, selector determines the depth of that modulation. And then down here, you can select the speed of the modulation. Over here, you've got the filter section, and this is just a basic, um, this is just a basic low-pass envelope filter. So you can set the cutoff frequency, but the cutoff frequency is going to, uh, it's going to essentially follow your attack release envelope. So this sets how much it's going to clamp down, but remember that that clamp is still going to follow the envelope. Here you can select the resonance, which, as you recall from my filter on low pass, uh, in my video on low pass filters, is essentially the peak at the cutoff frequency. Uh, then over here we've got the actual attack and release selectors. So this will this will determine how long it takes for the filter to open when you press the note, and how long it will take for the filter to close after you release the note. And then. Uh, AR 
int, I think that stands for attack release intensity. So that's essentially like the uh, depth of these attack release um, uh, filter clamping. And then velocity filter, that's how much the velocity information, meaning like how hard you press the note, will affect uh, this filter section. Then finally, you've got the effect section. So uh, volume should be pretty straightforward. That's how loud uh, your synth is. Velocity volume is how much the velocity information affects the output velocity, or sorry, the output volume of the synth. And then over here, we've got three effects. So um, chorus is actually really similar to a delay effect. It uh, layers the, sim the signal on top of itself and uh, creates a sound that makes it broader, as though there are multiple synths playing at the same time. Chorus 2 is just a deeper chorus effect, and then Ensemble is uh, a really complex effect, but it's also pretty similar to a chorus. All right, so that is all the functionality. Let's give it a shot and see you know, what kinds of things we can actually tweak here. So let's begin with um, the octaves. All right, you got a really high pitch. Right, and it's kind of cool as you can actually see how the harmonics are changing down here. Uh, and this is a sawtooth wave. Now let's look at a square wave. So now you're getting only the odd harmonics, remember? Whereas the sawtooth, you get a much broader spectrum. But remember our picture back here? As I change the pulse width, you should also start to get more harmonics. see all the other harmonics coming in there. Now let's look at the vibrato. And uh, with the square wave, this is a pulse width vibrato. I guess it's not technically a vibrato in that case. Uh, it's just changing the pulse width. You can change the cutoff frequency. Change the resonance, which gives you that peak at the cutoff. And you can change the intensity of the attack and release. So this will only come into play when we start clamping these down a bit. Velocity would just be like how hard you press the note will affect these parameters as well. Volume is pretty obvious. Um, and velocity as well. This is kind of neat. You can hear the chorus effect. And the effect should start sounding a lot more dry, I guess. Bring this up a bit. All right. So just before wrapping it up, I wanted to give an example of how I got a reasonably good sound out of the ESC. Uh, I was going for kind of a bright, plucked synth sound, almost like 80s, and that's what this uh, vibrato pulse width section is really good for. But um, I've got, okay, so the signal is kind of in the middle of the pulse width, so we'll get a nice broad spectrum. Uh, we've got a slight vibrato, like I mentioned, a relatively high cutoff, and then a relatively low attack. So it's going to be to the pluck, broad spectrum, and then um, that uh, bright synth sound. So, sound. Oh, and by the way, I've also got this routed through a reverb to give it an even broader sound, and the chorus also gives it that broad spectral sound. So here you got the pluck sound, and it's bringing the attack up. You hear how it kind of like swells into the note now, rather than being a pluck. It sounds much better down here, much more 80s to me. Got that going. So that is something to get you started. That is the ESE.